Good evening. Welcome to the program. I'm Leland Bitter. As we come on the air tonight, President Biden and congressional Democrats are on the verge of a stunning defeat in Washington that's going to have major implications for politics and, more importantly, for your pocketbook. President Biden's signature Build Back Better legislation likely won't pass before Christmas, putting into major question whether it will pass at all. The $2 trillion bill rewrote America's social contract with the government from cradle to grave with paid family leave, child tax credits, government subsidized daycare, free community college, and expansion of Medicare and Medicaid benefits, not to mention an enormous amount to do with spending on the climate. President Biden sold the bill as the best fix to the inflation rate, which is currently at 6.8%, the highest it's been in nearly 40 years. And now, as we see this, for the first time since the pandemic began, Americans say inflation and the economy is their biggest issue facing the country. CNN polling, what people are worried about, 75% say the economy, only 62% say COVID. Shelving Build Back Better is a double whammy for Mr. Biden. The president's advisors sold Build Back Better not only as a solution to inflation, but as a political solution to his approval ratings, which currently hover around 43%. On the economy, it's even worse for the president. ABC poll, Biden's handling of the economy, 57% disapprove, 41% approve. Things in Washington happen slowly and then very quickly. Today, a member of Mr. Biden's own party killed 11 months of work and the president's hopes for a win before Christmas in one hallway walk. News Nation's Kelly Meyer, live from the nation's capital with that story. Good evening, Kelly. Good evening, Leland. Well, it all comes back to one person here, Joe Manchin. I think back to a moment on Capitol Hill where Utah Senator Mitt Romney was getting on the elevator with Joe Manchin and called him Mr. President. That sums up the power Manchin has right now. President Biden calling him to get him on board with his Build Back Better agenda. For Manchin, his concern is over the length of the programs and the cost. Well, whatever we're considering doing or whatever uh, Congress is considering doing, they should do it within the limits of what we can afford. One of the sticking points is the child tax credit. Democrats say they won't separate that from the bill, but Manchin says while he supports it, the cost over 10 years is just too high. And he's also raising the alarm over what the bill would do to inflation. As you're mentioning, warning it's going up, not down. His party touts the plan isn't going to add to inflation at all. Leland? Yeah, we're going to get to the inflation numbers uh, in a minute. Clearly, uh, Democrats need Joe Manchin to get this done. You've got Joe Biden, the president today, saying it's going to be close, but I think we can get it done before Christmas. So how is this possible in terms of math? Well, if it's any indication of Democrats' hopes for this, the House already left for the holiday break. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi insists if the Senate passes the bill, she'll bring members of the House back to get this done by the end of the year. She told reporters today that she is still hopeful it will pass. I'm not going to have a postmortem on something that hasn't died. Leland, even though Pelosi is saying that, you can tell Democrats' balloon of confidence is losing air here because they're already changing the topic to voting rights, another agenda item Democrats can't seem to push through in the Senate. Leland? Yeah, they've got the same math problem there with Kirsten Sinema uh, saying she won't break the filibuster today for it. Uh, great reporting. Kelly, thank you very much. We're going to get to the political implications of Build Back Better's likely failure in a minute. But first, we want to talk about your pocketbook. A dollar buys substantially less today than it did a year ago. The average American family will spend, according to a Wharton Business School, University of Pennsylvania model, $3,500 in additional expenses this year. For example, look at the price increases across the board, food up 6.4%, new cars up 11%, rent 3%, lodging up 25%, utilities up 25%, gas prices up as well, used car prices up double digits, it goes on. We rarely get into the weeds of economics because they're complicated and confusing, but tonight we are at an inflection point for the American economy, and this is important. You might remember President Biden as an economic advisor promised us this summer inflation was, quote, transitory. Well, today, America's top banker acknowledged what we've been reporting for four months. High prices are here to stay, and the prices are going to keep going up. 
Today, Jerome Powell, chairman of the Federal Reserve, according to USA Today, said, I think it's probably a good time to retire that word, transitory. The prices of stuff that goes into everything we buy, oil to make gas, lumber to make houses, corn to make virtually every type of food, copper to make electronics, and piping for new homes. They're all going up. Manufacturers and suppliers, farmers and food makers, oil companies and gas station owners, all buy and sell on the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Nobody in the world has better insight into where prices are going than Terry Duffy, chairman and CEO of the CMA, who joins us now. Appreciate you being with us, sir, and making the time. Um, big picture, are consumers able to do anything about this right now, or are we just all along for the ride? Well, it's, it, it's, consumers always can do something. They always vote with their pocketbooks, and they obviously spend with their pocketbooks, Leland. So the consumers are at the, the thrust of all this inflation right now. There's a tremendous amount of capital flowing through the system. You know, you, a lot of things that uh, the Fed chair didn't talk too much about today was wage inflation. You know, wage inflation, you know, continues to rise. And once that happens, it's really hard to take it down, which means more people will be competing for less products, which will make everything much more expensive. So, yes, consumers have a big say in, in the process. The question will be, how long does it last for? As you're looking at the markets moving in the futures markets for all these inputs, these raw materials, what are the bets about how high things are going to go and how long the inflation is going to last? Well, you, you mentioned a moment ago that the Fed chair decided not to use the word uh, transitory any longer. You know, I, I believe that when they started using it, they never defined what transitory means, so they got away with using it for quite a bit of time anyway. You know, I think right now when the, what the Fed is doing with tapering, you know, back $30 uh, billion dollars on uh, treasuries and mortgages, is something that is only the, the beginning of trying to make money more expensive, expensive, which is to raise rates to try to tap down inflation. That is exactly what they have to do because that might be the only tool they have to uh, hit the inflation uh, component in the system right now because it's truly runaway. You mentioned it a moment ago, it's 6.8, 6.9% inflation, highest since 1982. But what you didn't mention is most of Americans have never seen inflation. We haven't had any inflation in 20 years. So we're at these record levels right now, but most of the people have never even seen it before. Yeah, and we're also so many people are now seeing rate hikes. Obviously, they've been very low, historic low mortgage rates, but those are going up. Credit card rates are going up. Car loans, if you want to buy a new car, all trying to get people uh, to spend less. Food prices are one that's exceptional. I know you guys see this a lot because of the commodities that you trade at the CME. Steak up 24.6%, pork up 17%, eggs 8, coffee 7.5. Uh, here was Jen Psaki talking about meat prices. Take a listen. People go to the grocery store and they're trying to buy a pound of meat, two pounds of meat, 10 pounds of meat. Um, it is, the prices are higher. That is in his view uh, and the view of our Secretary of Agriculture because of, you could call it corporate greed, sure. You could call it uh, jacking up prices uh, uh, it, during a pandemic. Are folks jacking up the prices or should we blame the cows? <laughs> Well, Leland, listen, I don't think it's corporate greed at all. I believe that the market is what it is. It's a supply-demand equation. You know, whether it's beef, corn, or any other commodity product, it's all supply-demand driven. It's not corporate uh, market. You got to remember, these markets all are global in nature. There's people all over the world competing for product that we uh, produce here in the United States. And what we do produce in the United States is food. And the rest of the world cannot participate in the in the production of food like we can here so you know what what the press secretary is saying is half truth what, what's going on here there's a lot of people competing for this product globally and there's only so much of it is there in fairness to the president who's obviously taken a licking when it comes to uh, his approval numbers because of inflation uh, and because of his handling of the economy in fairness is there anything he or the administration quote unquote the government could be doing or is the inflation horses already out of the barn. Inflation horses are out of the barn. Anytime you give away the, the, stim, the amount of stimulus that you did in such a short period of time, and you had all this pent up demand on top of it, the, the inflation was going to spike. So what they can do is what I said earlier, the Fed has the tools to normalize rates. If this is not something that they can, you know, the unemployment at 4.3, 4.4%, listen, to take rates up from these levels would give them the ability to tap down some inflation and also 
What's really important is give them the tools if something else happens in the future to lower rates. Right now, it's really hard to take rates below. Re normalized rates are actually below zero today, yeah. Leland. So, you know, I think the Fed, it's in their interest to take them up right now. The administration can, even though the Fed's an independent agency, is also have conversations with them about monetary policy and uh, make sure that they have some tools in their chest going forward. I, I, don't, I don't remember much biology or history, but I do remember a few things from my economics classes. And typically when rates go up, stocks go down. Today, stocks went up. How much of that was because of rates going up? How much of that you think was because Build Back Better looked like it was going to fail and suddenly $2 trillion isn't headed into the system? I think it was mostly the market anticipating the Fed maybe acting a little quicker than was originally advertised. The, some people were maybe assuming that the Fed would even potentially raise the overnight lending rate today, hmm. or they would potentially raise it early in the year, but they've kind of telegraphed what they're going to do, is what I said earlier, which is take down uh, some of the repurchases that they're doing on bonds and uh, other securities. So I think that's really why the market looked at that. The market can act very short term, as you know, Leland, and I think the market took it as where it's a, it's a year end rally. Let's take a look at that now. We'll worry about what they're going to do in 22 and 22. Oh, that's a good place to leave it. Good to see you, sir. Thanks for taking the time on a Wednesday night. My pleasure, Leland. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Think about the failure of Build Back Better, not from an economic perspective like we've been talking about, but from a political perspective whether you support President Biden or not. It means he heads into Christmas with three major foreign crises involving Russia, Iran, and China. We're gonna get to those in a few minutes. Families are gonna gather for the holidays talking about what we've been talking about, how much more everything costs. That's if you can get it. What if there's late Christmas presents? Also right now, you're dealing with a COVID spike. We'll get to Omicron in a minute as well. Even the most ardent Democrats agree that's less than ideal. We bring in Sarah Muha, Axios congressional reporter who covers the administration's arm twisting on the Hill. Brad Blakeman, member of then President George W. Bush's senior staff for perspective. Uh, Brad understands a rough Christmas with an unpopular president. He spent a couple himself with in that situation. Uh, nice to see you both. Uh, Sarah, um, start with you. Uh, build back better. Nancy Pelosi won't declare dead, but it seems as though they've called the priest for last rites. Evidently, Seeing we've had is a, a sort of breakdown. All right, Sarah, oh, you, you get you get. I, I know what you said was brilliant, but we couldn't hear you, so you get to start over. Is is it? Are we at uh, the priest's last rites for Build Back Better, or is it truly dead? Yeah, so uh, making sure you can hear me now while yes. I'm still talking before I go on. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, basically, well, we're in the Senate right now. That's where they need to make the decision. That's where they're going to be able to pass it or not. Senator Chuck Schumer this week was still saying that he's optimistic. However, we're seeing a breakdown of talks between Senator Joe Manchin. That's sort of the most important swing vote that the administration has to get over the over the ledge over there on the Hill. And then between him and President Biden, it seems like they're pretty far apart still. And if they cannot get Joe Manchin on board, then it's not likely that they're going to be able to get this passed. Yeah, you have to really wonder who has more power. Is it Joe Biden or Joe Manchin? Brad, this brings uh, me to you. Is it possible for a president to whip votes when he is as unpopular and sort of politically weak as Joe Biden is right now? Look, going into the next year's midterms, it's every man and woman for themselves. Uh, Joe Biden isn't going to be on the ballot uh, next year, although we'll make Republicans will certainly make him a topic of discussion. But uh, the members are going to have to uh, stand for their votes before the American people. And let's remember, the best scenario for Democrats is not going to happen. They're not going to get a vote on Build Back Better before the new year. Uh, that is the best possible time to pass a huge point of le legislation because people are not paying attention. Now, as you correctly point out, over the Thanksgiving table, it was all about inflation and the cost, the increased cost of, of goods. But you're, that's going to be a holdover for Christmas. And then they're also going to be talking about, is it really necessary to be spending billions of dollars we don't have on things we don't need? And remember, Leland, as we get into January, you're right up against the, the State of the Union. And there's not going to be much for the president to talk about if uh, Build Back Better is not passed before then. Hmm. And certainly after the State of the Union, uh, it's going to be focused on 2022.
Yeah, Jen Psaki was asked uh, for Joe Biden's biggest foreign policy achievement so far. She couldn't answer that. She didn't get the domestic policy question, but in terms of what they can sell at the State of the Union, you make a great point. Uh, the Build Back Better plan would be paid for essentially by taxing the rich, which is normally an incredibly popular thing championed by Elizabeth Warren. Um, this is her latest tweet. Uh, Let's change the tax code so the person of the year will actually pay t taxes and stop freeloading off of everyone else, referring to Elon Musk, who responded, please don't call the manager on me, Senator Karen. Uh, <laughs> it, went it, it went downhill, or I should say devolved into more Twitter fun from there. Sarah, what is the intersection for Democrats between the political war, which is fought among the political class, and then the culture war, which brings in a very different view when Elon Musk starts taking part in it. Yeah, well, first thing I'll say is uh, Twitter is sort of the place where uh, <laughs> class and decorum goes to die, doesn't yes. it? Uh, pretty much any time they have a conversation on there, that's what's going to happen. Um, you know, I think this specific conversation is interesting, and, and the culture war component is a, a major thing that Democrats were starting to see are considering uh, as they're looking toward the midterms and how they're going to run on these sort of more cultural aspects. You know, we saw Elon Musk and how he weighed in on that. But we also saw this in Virginia, right? We saw the culture war take uh, front and center uh, when they talked about critical race theory and education and, and how that all played in. So now Democrats have to figure out how much of that they want to infuse into the conversation in their own way when they're planning their own political strategies. Is trying to turn Elon Musk into a villain, Brad, a winning strategy? It is not. And I'm pleased that Elon Musk used my editorial <laughs> as a stunning indictment you know, it's uh, to get it's, back it's on Warren. It's stunning that we, I, have you, we had you on today. Yeah. It was not a coincidence, my friend. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, it was quite the shock. My, uh, my uh, phone lit up, my email lit up. But no, you know, Democrats always want a villain. And what better villain for Democrats, they think, is, is by demonizing the rich. Elon Musk is not a criminal. Elon Musk is using the laws to his best advantage. Who wouldn't do that? And, and by the way, it's Congress that makes the laws. So, uh, you know, demonizing yeah. Elon Musk. And by the way, hiring 60,000 plus IRS agents, it, do you think the average American thinks that that's a wise it, thing to do? We know the history of the IRS. Yeah, well, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's no, note, it it's, is noteworthy that the IRS, the Department of the Treasury, will accept any check that you send in in addition to the taxes you owe. Rarely does it happen, but sure. they, will, they will accept the check. Uh, Sarah, Brad, we'll leave it at there. Thank you both very much. It's good to see you. Thank you. Pleasure. Right. Well, one of the great mysteries and conspiracy theories of our time. A JFK records dump has happened. The Biden administration has declassified a whole bunch of documents related to the assassination. The new things we've learned, and more importantly, the questions still out there. Plus, China and Russia are cozying up. Putin and Xi putting on a united front. Are they doing it because they're strong or because they believe America is weak? The leaders of our two major adversaries appear to be cozying up, and it could perhaps spell some bad news for all of us. These are images from a summit today between Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping. They seem quite cozy and happy together. Judging by the pictures, the two dictators had a nice long talk. And in fact, a Kremlin aide told the New York Times they did indeed. The two countries do not have a formal alliance, but Mr. Xi told Mr. Putin that it's in its closeness and effectiveness, this relationship even exceeds an alliance. In times like this, we turn to a man with deep understanding of how the Chinese operate, Gordon Chang, author of The Great U.S.-China Tech War, The Coming Collapse of China, joins us now. Gordon, we appreciate you, you being here on sh such short notice. Uh, are they joining forces because they're both strong or they're both weak? I think they're joining forces because they're both weak. But both China and Russia, although they're fragile states, have willful, strong leaders. And the United States, which is a strong state, has a weak leader. So therefore, I think China and Russia believe that they can actually make some uh, gains at the expense of the United States and the international community. You know, Churchill said nations don't have permanent allies, they have permanent interests. What are the interests of China and Russia that are aligning? 
They both see the world in the same terms, and they identify the same adversary, which is us. You know, Biden actually said, look, if, if Russia invades Ukraine, we're not going to use force. So Putin realizes he needs an economic backstop because he can see the United States and Europe will impose economic sanctions. Well, he can go to China and China can backstop his economy, give him the money uh, that he needs. So therefore, this is really a marriage of convenience. And Leland, a lot of people say, oh, you know, China and Russia, they don't get along. Well, they're, yeah, they are getting along. And in the short term, they do form an enduring partnership. Yeah, no, you talked about the financial uh, issues here, the discussion, at least, of them trying to form a banking system that goes around the Western banking rules. Therefore, if they're sanctioned and kicked out of the U.S. banking system, they can still move money around. Uh, it was interesting you said about the personal relationship between Xi and Putin, both strong men, both who have consolidated power, obviously in a little bit different ways. But you just look at their personal relationship, the, the way that the Xi-Putin summit were, was portrayed by the Kremlin, uh, in one picture, and then on the other side, we have the picture of the way the Putin-Biden summit uh, was portrayed. Uh, that sort of, that picture says everything. Yes, it does. And, and, you know, we know that it was contentious when Biden was talking to Putin last week. Um, but because Putin and Xi Jinping are, are really on the same page, you can see that they've got a much better relationship. So is, is it, is it as clear? Would it have been as clear in their conversation that uh, Xi said, hey, you invade Ukraine, I'm going to support you, and Putin says, you invade ta Taiwan, I'll support you? It could very well have been that. But it doesn't need to be that, Leland, because if, if for instance, um, Russia invades Ukraine, China, even without direct coordination, could see that it's got an opportunity because the United States and Europe are going to be um, focused on, on uh, Europe. So I, I think that actually it doesn't need to actually have the direct coordination. Mm -hmm. All they have to do is see there's an opportunity. This came out of the meeting, um, this quote. We firmly support each other on issues concerning each other's core interests and safeguarding the dignity of each country. Translate that diplomatic speak for us in 30 seconds. It is basically saying we can commit genocide, crimes against humanity, invade, and break apart our neighbors, and we do not want to be criticized because that's our core interest. Yeah, safeguarding the dignity sounds a lot better than the way you described it, but I guess we'll take it if it's the same thing. Gordon, it was good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Leland. All the best. Incredible analysis by Gordon Chang. Regimens work against Omicron. At this point, there is no need for a variant specific booster. Important and very good news if true. Omicron is contagious, but we are learning less severe than other variants of COVID. The CDC is warning of a major winter surge across the country. Of course, you gotta wonder, is case numbers really what we should be worried about? Some governors in states like California and New York are worried about case counts. They're reimposing mask mandates, whether you're vaccinated or not. But Colorado's governor, Jared Polis, one of the most liberal governors in the United States, says his state, his citizens, are ready to move on. What we see it as the end of the, the medical emergency, frankly. People who want to be protected are. Those who get sick, it's almost entirely their own darn fault. A position for sure. Many other Democratic governors are finding themselves in a tough spot on COVID, particularly ahead of next year's elections, with Americans increasingly fatigued over mask and vaccine mandates, the Washington Post reports the recent meeting, Democratic governors acknowledged a growing resistance to pandemic rules. Not a silent majority, but a very loud minority that know how to find the ballot box. Dave Weigel, the author of that piece, covers politics from the Washington Post. He always joins us from a dark cave where he's doing incredibly rep <laughs> incredible reporting. Hotel room or office. Dave, it's good to see you uh, as always. Uh, I'm thinking about that line uh, a, a vocal minority. It's got to be focused primarily gov Michigan Governor uh, Gretchen Whitmer. Well, not just her. Uh, most of the governors who are up for re-election 2018 are doing it in states that Joe Biden carried. In most of those states, if you, if you ask people in a poll, most of them do support a lot of the safety measures that have been put in place. But this is, I mean, just in your introduction, you get to how complicated it is. Uh, 
what is a mask mandate mean? What it, well, you will talk about a vaccine mandate, but in, in, it, the governors will correct you and say we mean a vaccine or testing mandate. But in general, they're confident that most people are comfortable with some of the measures that have been put in place when there is a surge they're getting less comfortable uh, it's not it's not a, it is not a majority yet they're not they are not and look the phil, Mur uh, phil murphy in new jersey uh one of the people i talked to for this story just won re-election uh, in a state where people were angry about that it cost them votes but they were able to put together a majority together what they're saying is that look everyone wants this over right and the and they want to combat the impression um uh, which is out there, which which some Republicans run on, that these gov these governors want to put ma uh, mandates in effect forever. They say, no, we're as exhausted as you are. And that's a different message than they had in 2020 when people thought, if the vaccines are coming, we're going to be done with all of this in a couple of months. Yeah, it does seem like a different, a different message. You say Phil Murphy was able to put together a majority. He still lost 15, 16 points. Gretchen Whitmer and a number of others that mm -hmm. are up in 2022 don't have 15 or 16 points uh, to lose. This is what Murphy said uh, to Politico, not to you, but uh, uh, some New Jerseyans feel like government is not connecting with them. They're sick of masks, being told what to do in terms of vaccines, probably not thrilled with what they sense is going on in Washington. They may not, they may have lost a job or a business that went bust or a loved one worse yet. Uh, interestingly enough, Murphy is now the guy running the Democratic Governors Association head into the 2022 uh, elections uh, in trying to keep Democrats in governor's mansions. What does it say that they picked him rather than somebody super liberal? Well, it, it's not Murphy, it's Roy Cooper, the governor of North Carolina, who's the chair leading into the new year, but ha he has the same position and he is not, you're, you're right, somebody who's seen as one of the more liberal governors. Although if you look for the most liberal democratic governor, they're not as liberal as the most liberal member of Congress. And governors are, have, have to win a different majority. Uh, but the other gov governors who were up in 2022 really are emphasizing, I didn't want to do this. Uh, uh, Janet Mills, the governor of Maine, was telling me, I, no one runs for this office thinking, I'm going to be the governor who cancels uh, high school graduations and cancels doctor's visits. They, they, they are trying to emphasize this is awful and we all want it to be over with. Uh, and the contrast with, from, from Republicans very consistently, Maine and every state, is mm -hmm. Nope. Throw out everything. We, we, we're done with mandates. We're yeah. done with restrictions. Uh, there, uh, whether, whatever your position on the vaccine is, and it changes from candidate to candidate, uh, look, we can't, be, we can't keep shutting people down because at this point, the risk of social alienation, economic hardship, job loss is greater yeah. than the, the risk you of know, people. And the, uh, the, point, uh, uh, the point you make in your piece now, yeah. the point you make in your piece that, that saving mm -hmm. lives is not necessarily now the only metric that governors feel right. and realize are being measured by is, uh, is the important one. Dave, great reporting as always. We're glad to have you. Thank you. All right. Thank you again. Appreciate it. Yeah. There's a new ruling in the Jeffrey Epstein case that may be very good. How's that possible for Prince Andrew? And up next, the new First Amendment fight, why a judge had to tell a school board to stop censoring parents. A federal judge says a Philadelphia area school board must stop censoring parents at school board meetings. Here's the ruling. It says it cannot stop public comments that the board deems offensive. The board had banned certain comments, including those considered personally directed, offensive, abusive, and in their minds, irrelevant. The judge says the school board rules appear to be vague and overbroad. Now, other school boards in the area have similar rules and likely have to reconsider their policies. Alan Gura, vice president for litigation at the Institute for Free Speech, represented a group of parents and community members in this, joins us now. Uh, counselor, good to see you. Uh, this seems to be like basic First Amendment, right? You're allowed to petition your government for the redress of grievances, even if you uh, personally direct your comments, they're offensive, abusive, and irrelevant. That's exactly correct. The First Amendment is there to protect the speech that other people don't like. If everyone liked what you had to say, you wouldn't need a federal judge to protect your right to say it. Uh, we have a problem with some school boards that have forgotten uh, this basic lesson of the First Amendment. And uh, at Pensbury, outside of Philadelphia, they've seen fit to shout down uh, uh, parents and community members, scream at them, kick them out of meetings, whenever they said something that uh, was offensive uh, in the minds of the school board, uh, meaning, uh, meaning the people just disagreed with the policies that they were enacting. Hey, look, in, in some of these school board meetings have gotten very heated. We're showing videos here uh, of some of them where people were arrested and uh, there were people who got death threats, I believe, in, in one of these cases. Why is this case important uh, beyond school boards in Pennsylvania? 
It's important for school boards throughout the country. We want to send a signal. Look, Americans are going to disagree about issues, and obviously school boards these days are going to have to deal with all kinds of contentious matters. And they'll decide what they decide, and if people don't like the decision, there's an election. However, people have the right to express their views. They, they need to do so peacefully. That's not a problem. Uh, but uh, if the parent comes into the school board and says something that the school administrator doesn't want to hear, that's just too bad. Uh, they need to sit there and listen to it and hopefully think about it and, and take it into account in making policy. So what, where does this go from here as the school boards now have become ground zero? We know school boards were such a huge issue in the Virginia governor's race. Uh, do you're going to you're gonna have to have these cases all over the country, or is Pennsylvania the only place where school boards try to do this? Oh, no, we're having problems throughout the country. In fact, we're suing another school board in Brevard County, Florida, we're going to be launching another school board case somewhere else. I can't talk about it yet. Uh, but we're, we're going to keep suing the school boards when they silence parents. Look, the school board can set certain yeah, rules I, for I guess here's, here's my question, though. Why is the school board doing this? Why not just let parents yell for their three minutes and then leave? That's a great question for the school board. I think the reason is that uh, some people uh, believe so strongly in in, uh, in their policies that they just cannot tolerate any criticism. Yeah, we're, we're, we're mo was most of this over CRT and sort of the social justice, trans rights issues that we've seen in the culture wars? At Pennsbury, it's about various things, mostly CRT. In other school districts, we have problems over uh, curriculum, over what kind of books are in the schools, COVID restrictions, hmm. anything that people have strong beliefs about. There's going to be a school board member somewhere whose belief is so strong that they just don't want to have it questioned. They don't want to have a challenge. They don't want to hear from these annoying parents and taxpayers who don't agree. And they think that they can toss people out when they say something that, the, that you just said, please the board. And you said Brevard County, Florida, um, which without Central Florida, the National Enquirer would publish monthly. A news director once told me that when I got a job in Florida. So crazy things happen in Florida. But when you file the suit against the place you can't talk about, come back and discuss it with us, all right? We'd love to do that. Yeah, we'd appreciate it. Thanks, Alan, for your time. Prince Andrew, of all people, could now be protected from any Epstein lawsuits by a secret settlement. How is this even possible? Is Ghislaine Maxwell still on trial? We'll tell you when we come back. Never thought I would say this. There is good news for Prince Andrew. He could escape any liability related to sex assault allegations against him and his friend, the late Jeffrey Epstein. Virginia Guffrey claims the prince had sex with her when she was just 17, but Epstein signed a settlement with Virginia in 2009, which shields him and any others, including the prince, from any liability. This settlement has been under seal, but could be made public just after the new year. All right, Karen Conti, legal analyst, founder of the Conti Law Firm, joins us now. Does this smell as much as it seems on its face? Well, I, I just think the whole thing smells. Of well, yes, yeah, no kidding. Okay, and so the prince is saying, I didn't know this girl, but if I did, she was, I didn't have sex with her. But if she, we did, then she was under, she was under 18, but more than 17. And if I did have sex with her, well, well maybe the, it's unconstitutional, the whole law there. And then finally, now we have a settlement agreement that pops up. So he's got lots of defenses. And why haven't we seen the settlement agreement? Shouldn't have, that have been front and center of his defense from day one? Right. And if I didn't know her, how did I end up with this picture of me and her together with <laughs> Elaine Maxwell. Maxwell's on trial right now. Are we in what's surprising is what hasn't been said in this trial, right? There haven't been all these questions about Prince Andrew and about Bill Clinton and about Bill Gates and about Alan Dershowitz and all the people, all the famous people connected to Epstein who spent time on his planes and in his islands and allegedly with some of his girls. Well, I think they brought it up just a little bit to show that the girls had reason to believe that Epstein was an up and up character. Hey, there was Donald Trump, there was Bill Clinton. I mean, these were very important people and prominent people. So I could felt I could trust them. And I think that's how those presents, you know, were being used. Uh, but this whole thing is just a circle of really tawdry behavior that... Well, <laughs> yeah, and, and also, the, you know, the, the very, very lenient settlement agreement that Epstein signed with the federal government so he didn't get prosecuted. He only pled to one count. How is it that Epstein signed a settlement with Virginia in 2009, shields him from any liability? How does that, sh how does an agreement between other people shield a third party who allegedly had sex with a minor? 
Well, I'm speculating that what the agreement said was that Jeffrey Epstein was going to pay a certain amount of money and that, in effect, Goffrey was going to release not only Epstein, but all of his cohorts, meaning maybe Maxwell and maybe his other people who were there at the time. So Epstein was trying to do something to protect his buddies so they won't, wouldn't get in trouble either. That's my guess, if, in fact, the agreement says what we think it says. Which is a big if, and obviously we're going to find out. The fact that the prosecutors, though, haven't asked more of the women who testified in the Maxwell trial, what'd you do with Donald Trump when you met him at Mar-a-Lago? What were your interactions with Bill Clinton like? What, all, on and on and on. What were your interactions with Prince Andrew like? Did you meet him? Did you go to London, et cetera? What does that tell you about the prosecution? Well, I think they have to focus on what they can prove. And if they can't prove something, why throw it out there? Why throw out that Donald Trump is involved in this when there's no proof that he is? Same with Bill Clinton. I mean, those people were there, and there's a purpose for, for them being mentioned. But I think the prosecution wants to keep this case clean. There were these victims, and Ghislaine Maxwell participated in, trafficked the girls, brought them in, and actually participated in some of the sexual activity, which was kind of a surprising fact to me. Interestingly enough, the, the, trial, the prosecution rested on Friday. The, the defense is going right now. We thought the prosecution was going to last a long time. Now the defense says they may have 35 witnesses. It feels as though the defense is pretty confident right now, and we may never get an answer to all of these questions about Bill Clinton and Prince Andrew and everybody else. We may never know. That was little <laughs> black books that were there, and then they weren't there. I mean, The hard knows? drives, the pictures, the CDs, they're all gone. And when Jeffrey Epstein killed himself... Uh, that whole thing is gone, too. So this case is going to have a lot of questions that are going to go unanswered for a long time. Yeah, unless, unless Maxwell takes the stand. We shall see. Then, you're, then we'll have a lot to talk about, a whole show, perhaps. Karen, good to see you. Good Thank to see you, you Lillian. Take care. All right. Well, conspiracy theories about Jeffrey Epstein and conspiracy theories and questions about the JFK assassination. They've gone on for decades. Now, new documents say maybe the conspiracy theorists weren't as crazy as we all thought. Why, when we come back? Welcome back. There are moments in history where everyone knows where they were at the time. For me, it's 9-11. The assassination of JFK, of course, is one of them. Since that day in November of 1963, the assassination has been the subject of speculation, conspiracy theories, and mysteries. Today, we got 1,500 pages that bring up some more questions than perhaps answers. This is the headline from the New York Post. Oswald met KGB before JFK assassination. Delayed records dump shows. You'll recall JFK's killer, Lee Harvey Oswald, was a former Marine who defected in the Soviet Union a free few years before killing Kennedy in Dallas in 62. National Security Attorney Mark Zaid represented some of the Secret Service agents in Dallas when Kennedy was shot and has investigated the crime ever since. Uh, good to see you, Counselor. We appreciate it. Uh, to a novice like me, the fact that Oswald did indeed meet with the KGB sounds significant and certainly acknowledging what conspiracy theorists were called crazy for thinking. I'm not sure I'd go that far yet. I'll say, right, 1,500 documents were released, 20,000 pages almost. But I'll tell you what I'm hearing so far from many of the leading JFK assassination researchers and authors, quite a number of whom that I represent or have. They're going through the documents. It's going to take a while, obviously. And they're sending an email out to our group chat saying, wow, I just saw this. This sounds really significant. What do you guys think? And then somebody responds, uh, actually, we've had that since 1983. There's so much voluminous material that people can't keep track of actually what's been released so far. But there has been some really interesting information released, particularly dealing with Oswald's visit to Mexico City in 1963, two months before the assassination. He visited the Soviet and the Cuban embassies. And we've started to learn some more information about that, particularly with respect to how much the CIA was actually monitoring his actions and movement at the time. What is the, if there's one big question that the documents could answer, and we understand there's still documents that are classified, there's still some that have not been released, there's still redacted parts of different documents. But what is the one big question that could break the case wide open, so to speak, or put all the conspiracy theories to rest? 
Oh, there definitely are a number of questions like that, but I dare say we're not going to get the answer in any of the documents that are going to be forthcoming, even in the next year or years. Some documents we may never get, particularly because there are statutes that prevent them from being released, IRS documents, court records that are sealed. But these records were compiled by an entity that went out of existence in 1998 called the Assassination Records Review Board. And the chairman, former chairman of that, is a federal district judge in Minnesota. And he's seen what documents there are that have been withheld. And they, while they can't reveal what the information is, the, the former members who were very well respected, I worked with them many, many times over the years in the 90s, have said there's nothing in there that, that's going to change the dynamics of the case uh, one way or the other. What it's doing is filling in gaps, particularly for historians. I mean, it's very valuable information so that we know more about what our intelligence agencies and foreign policy uh, was during Cold War, especially during the early 60s into the 1970s. You think about it, Kennedy was killed in Dallas in November of 63. That's a little less than 60 uh, years ago. What possibly could be the justification for keeping this stuff still classified when, to your point, it could put a lot of things to rest. I'll give you one easy example that I'm sure applies to a small number of documents. When Oswald went to the embassies in Mexico City, we had sources report to the CIA that he had made those meetings, including perhaps with KGB personnel who, not surprisingly, were stationed in Mexico City. Even though that's 58 years ago, that sounds like an attorney ago, I wasn't born yet, I was born a few years later. Those people, those staff who worked in the embassy were in their mid-20s. They're in their early to mid-80s now. Some of these people are likely still alive. And you can imagine what the Cuban government or maybe the Russian government now, and obviously former Soviet Union, might do to them or their families right. where it found out that they revealed information to the CIA as traitors to their country 60 years ago. Mark, Mark it's such a fascinating uh, case, and we're so glad to have you uh, to talk about it. Thank you, and uh, obviously there's more documents, which means we get to have you back uh, to discuss them. It was good to see you. Thank you. My pleasure. Happy holiday. All the best to you and yours uh, as well. That does it for us tonight. How a Bass Pro Shops baseball hat became a cultural icon. We'll tackle that this week. Here's Dan Abrams. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.